Part two, chapter nine of the House of the Dead by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translator unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter nine, the escape. A little while after the major resigned, our prison was subjected to a thorough reorganization. The hard labor hitherto inflicted and the other regulations were abolished and the place put upon the footing of the military convict establishments of russia as a result of this prisoners of the second category were no longer sent there this class was for the future to be composed of prisoners who were regarded as still on the military footing that is to say men who in spite of sentence did not forfeit forever their civic status they were soldiers still but had undergone corporal punishment they were sentenced for comparatively short periods six years at most when they had served their time or in case of pardon they went into the ranks again as before men guilty of a second offence were sentenced to twenty years of imprisonment up to the time i speak of we had a section of soldier prisoners among us but only because they did not know where else to dispose of them now the place was to be occupied by soldiers exclusively as to the civilian convicts who were stripped of all civic rights branded cropped and shaven these were to remain in the fortress to finish their time but as no fresh prisoners of this class were to come in and those there would get their discharge successively at the end of ten years there would be no civilian convicts left in the place according to the arrangements the line of division between the classes of prisoners there was maintained from time to time there came in other military criminals of high position sent to our place for security before being forwarded to eastern siberia for the more aggravated penalties that awaited them there there was no change in our general way of life the work we had to do and the discipline observed were the same as before but the administrative system was entirely altered and made more complex an officer commandant of companies was assigned to be at the head of the prison he had under his orders four subaltern officers who mounted guard by turns the invalids were superseded by twelve non-commissioned officers and an arsenal superintendent the convicts were divided into sections of ten and corporals chosen among them the power of these over the others was as may be supposed nominal as might be expected akim akimitch got this promotion all these new arrangements were confided to the governor to carry out who remained in superior command over the whole establishment the changes did not go further than this at first the convicts were not a little excited by this movement and discussed their new guardians a good deal among themselves trying to make out what sort of fellows they were but when they saw that everything went on pretty much as usual they quieted down and things resumed their ordinary course we had got rid of the major and that was something everybody took fresh breath and fresh courage the fear that was in all hearts grew less we had some assurance that in case of need we could go to our superiors and lodge our complaint and that a man could not be punished without cause and would not unless by mistake brandy was brought in as before although we had subaltern officers now where invalids were before these subalterns were all worthy careful men who knew their place in business there were some among them who had the idea that they might give themselves grand airs and treat us like common soldiers but they soon gave it up and behaved like the others those who did not seem to be well able to get into their heads what the ways of our prison really were had sharp lessons about it from the convicts themselves which led to some lively scenes one sub-officer was confronted with brandy which was of course too much for him when he was sober again we had a little explanation with him we pointed out that he had been drinking with the prisoners and that accordingly etc etc he became quite tractable the end of it was that the subalterns closed their eyes to the brandy business they went to market for us just as the invalids used to and brought the prisoners white bread meat anything that could be got in without too much risk so i never could understand why they had gone to the trouble of turning the place into a military prison the change was made two years before i left the place i had two years to bear of it still i see little use in recording all i saw and went through later at the convict establishment day by day if i were to tell it all all the daily and hourly occurrences 
i might write twice or thrice as many chapters as this book ought to contain but i should simply tire the reader and myself substantially all that i might write has been already embodied in the narrative as it stands so far and the reader has had the opportunity of getting a tolerable idea of what the life of a convict of the second class really was my wish has been to portray the state of things at the establishment and as it affected myself accurately and yet forcibly whether i have done so others must judge i cannot pronounce upon my own work but i think i may well draw it to a close as i move among these recollections of a dreadful past the old suffering comes up again and all but strangles me besides i cannot be sure of my memory as to all i saw in these last years for the faculty seems blunted as regards the latter compared with the earlier period of my imprisonment there is a good deal i am sure i have quite forgotten but i remember only too well how very very slow these last two years were how very sad how the days seemed as if they never would come to evening something like water falling drop by drop i remember too that i was filled with a mighty longing for my resurrection from that grave which gave me strength to bear up to wait and to hope and so i got to be hardened and enduring i lived on expectation i counted every passing day if there were a thousand more of them to pass at the prison i found satisfaction in thinking that one of them was gone and only nine hundred and ninety-nine to come i remember too that though i had round me a hundred persons in like case i felt myself more and more solitary and though the solitude was awful i came to love it isolated thus among the convict crowd i went over all my earlier life analyzing its events and thoughts minutely i passed my former doings in review and sometimes was pitiless in condemnation of myself sometimes i went so far as to be grateful to fate for the privilege of such loneliness for only that could have caused me so severely to scrutinize my past so searchingly to examine its inner and outer life what strong and strange new germs of hope came in those memorable hours up in my soul i weighed and decided all sorts of issues i entered into a compact with myself to avoid the errors of former years and the rocks on which i had been wrecked i laid down a programme for my future and vowed that i would stick to it i had a sort of blind and complete conviction that once away from that place i should be able to carry out everything i made up my mind to i looked for my freedom with transports of eager desire i wanted to try my strength in a renewed struggle with life sometimes i was clutched as by fangs by an impatience which rose to fever heat it is painful to go back to these things most painful nobody i know can care much about it at all except myself but i write because i think people will understand and because there are those who have been those who yet will be like myself condemned imprisoned cut off from life in the flower of their age and in the full possession of all their strength but all this is useless let me end my memoirs with a narrative of something interesting for i must not close them too abruptly what shall it be well it may occur to some to ask whether it was quite impossible to escape from the jail and if during the time i spent there no attempt of the kind was made i have already said that a prisoner who has got through two or three years thinks a good deal of it and as a rule concludes that it is better to finish his time without running more risks so that he may get his settlement on the land or otherwise when set at liberty but those who reckon in this way are convicts sentenced for comparatively short times those who have many years to serve are always ready to run some chances for all that the attempts at escape were quite infrequent whether that was attributable to the want of spirit in the convicts the severity of the military discipline enforced or after all to the situation of the town little favourable to escapes for it was in the midst of the open steppe i really cannot say all these motives no doubt contributed to give pause it was difficult enough to get out of the prison at all in my time two convicts tried it they were criminals of importance when our major had been got rid of a the spy was quite alone with nobody to back him up he was still quite young but his character grew in force with every year he was a bold self-asserting fellow of considerable intelligence i think if they had set him at liberty he would have gone on spying and getting money in every sort of shameful way 
but i don't think he would have let himself be caught again he would have turned his experiences as a convict to far too much good for that one trick he practised was that of forging passports at least so i heard from some of the convicts i think this fellow was ready to risk everything for a change in his position circumstances gave me the opportunity of getting to the bottom of this man's disposition and seeing how ugly it was he was simply revolting in his cold deep wickedness and my disgust with him was more than i could get over i do believe that if he wanted a drink of brandy and could only have got it by killing someone he would not have hesitated one moment if it was pretty certain the crime would not come out he had learned there in that jail to look on everything in the coolest calculating way it was on him that the choice of kulikov of the special section fell as we are to see i have spoken before of kulikov he was no longer young but full of ardour life and vigour and endowed with extraordinary faculties he felt his strength and wanted still to have a life of his own there are some men who long to live in a rich abounding life even when old age has got hold of them i should have been a good deal surprised if kulikov had not tried to escape but he did which of the two kulikov and a had the greater influence over the other i really cannot say they were a goodly couple and suited each other to a hair so they soon became as thick as possible i fancy that kulikov reckoned on a to forge a passport for him besides the latter was of the noble class belonged to good society a circumstance out of which a good deal could be made if they managed to get back into russia heaven only knows what compacts they made or what plans and hopes they formed if they got as far as russia they would at all events leave behind them siberia and vagabondage kulikov was a versatile man capable of playing many a part on the stage of life and had plenty of ability to go upon whatever direction his efforts took to such persons the jail is strangulation and suffocation so the two set about plotting their escape but to get away without a soldier to act as escort was impossible so a soldier had to be won in one of the battalions stationed at our fortress was a pole of middle life an energetic fellow worthy of a better fate serious courageous when he arrived first in siberia quite young he had deserted for he could not stand his sufferings from nostalgia he was captured and whipped during two years he formed part of the disciplinary companies to which offenders are sent then he rejoined his battalion and showing himself zealous in the service had been rewarded by promotion to the rank of corporal he had a good deal of self-love and spoke like a man who had no small conceit of himself i took particular notice of the man sometimes when he was among the soldiers who had charge of us for the poles had spoken to me about him and i got the idea that his longing for his native country had taken the form of a chill fixed deadly hatred for those who kept him away from it he was the sort of man to stick at nothing and kulikov showed that his scent was good when he pitched on this man to be an accomplice in his flight this corporal's name was kohler kulikov and he settled their plans and fixed the day it was the month of june the hottest of the year the climate of our town and neighbourhood was pretty equable especially in summer which is a very good thing for tramps and vagabonds to make off far after leaving the fortress was quite out of the question it being situated on rising ground and in uncovered country for though surrounded by woods these are a considerable distance away a disguise was indispensable and to procure it they must manage to get into the outskirts of the town where kulikov had taken care some time before to prepare a den of some sort i don't know whether his worthy friends in that part of the town were in the secret it may be presumed they were though there is no evidence that year however a young woman who led a gay life and was very pretty settled down in a nook of that same part of the city near the county this young person attracted a good deal of notice and her career promised to be something quite remarkable her nickname was fire and flame i think that she and the fugitives concerted the plans of escape together for kulikov had lavished a good deal of attention and money on her for more than a year when the gangs were formed each morning the two fellows kulikov and a managed to get themselves sent out with the convict chilkin whose trade was that of stove-maker and plasterer to do up the empty barracks when the soldiers went into camp a and kulikov 
were to help in carrying the necessary materials kohler got himself put into the escort on the occasion as the rules required three soldiers to act as escort for two prisoners they gave him a young recruit whom he was doing corporal's duty upon drilling and training him our fugitives must have exercised a great deal of influence over kohler to deceive him to cast his lot in with them serious intelligent and reflective man as he was with so few more years of service to pass in the army they arrived at the barracks about six o'clock in the morning there was nobody with them after having worked about an hour kulikov and a told chilkin that they were going to the workshop to see someone and fetch a tool they wanted they had to go carefully to work with chilkin and speak in as natural a tone as they could the man was from moscow by trade a stove-maker sharp and cunning keen-sighted not talkative fragile in appearance with little flesh on his bones he was the sort of person who might have been expected to pass his life in honest working dress in some moscow shop yet here he was in the special section after many wanderings and transfers among the most formidable military criminals so fate had ordered what had he done to deserve such severe punishment i had not the least idea he never showed the least resentment or sour feeling and went on in a quiet inoffensive way now and then he got as drunk as a lord but apart from that his conduct was perfectly good of course he was not in the secret so he had to be thrown off the scent kulikov told him with a wink that they were going to get some brandy which had been hidden the day before in the workshop which suited chilkin's book perfectly he had not the least notion of what was up and remained alone with the young recruit while kulikov a and kohler betook themselves to the suburbs of the town half an hour passed the men did not come back chilkin began to think and the truth dawned upon him he remembered that kulikov had not seemed at all like himself that he had seen him whispering and winking to a he was sure of that and the whole thing seemed suspicious to him kohler's behaviour had struck him too when he went off with the two convicts the corporal had given the recruit orders what he was to do in his absence which he had never known him do before the more chilkin thought over the matter the less he liked it time went on the convicts did not return his anxiety was great for he saw that the authorities would suspect him of connivance with the fugitives so that his own skin was in danger if he made any delay in giving information of what had occurred suspicion of himself would grow into conviction that he knew what the men intended when they left him and he would be dealt with as their accomplice there was no time to lose it came into his mind then that kulikov and a had become markedly intimate for some time and that they had been often seen laying their heads together behind the barracks by themselves he remembered too that he had more than once fancied that they were up to something together he looked attentively at the soldier with him as escort the fellow was yawning leaning on his gun and scratching his nose in the most innocent manner imaginable so chilkin did not think it necessary to speak of his anxieties to this man he told him simply to come with him to the engineers workshops his object was to ask if anybody there had seen his companions but nobody there had so chilkin's suspicions grew stronger and stronger if only he could think that they had gone to get drunk and have a spree in the outskirts of the town as kulikov often did no thought chilkin that was not so they would have told him for there was no need to make a mystery of that chilkin left his work and went straight back to the jail it was about nine o'clock when he reached the sergeant major to whom he mentioned his suspicions that officer was frightened and at first could not believe that there was anything in it all chilkin had in fact expressed no more than a vague misgiving that all was not as it should be the sergeant major ran to the major who in his turn ran to the governor in a quarter of an hour all necessary measures were taken the governor-general was communicated with as the convicts in question were persons of importance it might be expected that the matter would be seriously viewed at st petersburg a was classed among political prisoners by a somewhat random official proceeding it would seem kulikov was a convict of the special section that is to say as a criminal of the blackest dye and what was worse was an ex-soldier it was then brought to notice that according to the regulations each convict of the special section ought to have two soldiers assigned as escort when he went to work the regulations had not been observed as to this so that everybody was exposed to serious trouble 
expresses were sent off to all the district officers of the municipality and all the little neighbouring towns to warn the authorities of the escape of the two convicts and a full description furnished of their persons cossacks were sent out to hunt them up letters sent to the authorities of all adjoining governmental districts and everybody was frightened to death the excitement was quite as great all through the prison as the convicts returned from work they heard the tremendous news which spread rapidly from man to man all received it with deep though secret satisfaction their emotion was as natural as it was great the affair broke the monotony of their lives and gave them something to think of but above all it was an escape and as such something to sympathize with deeply and stirred fibres in the poor fellows which had long been without any exciting stimulus something like hope and a disposition to confront their fate set their hearts beating for the incident seemed to show that their hard lot was not hopelessly unchangeable well you see they've got off in spite of them why shouldn't we the thought came into every man's mind and made him stiffen his back and look at his neighbours in a defiant sort of way all the convicts seemed to grow an inch taller on the strength of it and to look down a bit upon the sub-officers the heads of the place soon came running up as you may imagine the governor now arrived in person we fellows looked at them all with some assurance with a touch of contempt and with a very set expression of face as though to say well you there we can get out of your clutches when we've a mind to all the men were quite sure there would be a general searching of everything and everybody so everything that was at all contraband was carefully hidden for the authorities would want to show that precious wisdom of theirs which might be reckoned on after the event the expectation was verified there was a mighty turning of everything upside down and topsy-turvy a general rummage with the discovery of exactly nothing as they might have known when the time came for going out to work after dinner the usual escorts were doubled when night came the officers and sub-officers on service came pouncing on us at every moment to see if we were off our guard and if anything could be got out of us the lists were gone over once more than the usual number of times which extra mustering only gave more trouble for nothing we were hunted out of the courtyard that our names might be gone through again then when in barrack they reckoned us up another time as if they never could be done with the exercise the convicts were not at all disturbed by all this bustling absurdity they put on a very unconcerned demeanour and as is always the case in such a conjuncture behaved in the prettiest manner all that evening and night we won't give them any handle anyhow was the general feeling the question with the authorities was whether some among us were not in complicity with those who had got away so a careful watch was kept over our doings and a careful ear for our conversations but nothing came of it not such fools those fellows as to leave anybody behind who was in the secret when you go at that sort of thing you lie low and play low kulikov and a know enough to have covered up their tracks they've done the trick in first-rate style keeping things to themselves they've mizzled the rascals clever chaps those they could get through shut doors the glory of kulikov and a had grown a hundred cubits higher than it was everybody was proud of them their exploit it was felt would be handed down to the most distant posterity and outlive the jail itself rattling fellows those said one can't get away from here eh that's their notion is it just look at those chaps yes said a third looking very superior but who is it that has got away tip-top fellows you can't hold a candle to them at any other time the man to whom anything of that sort was said would have replied angrily enough and defended himself now the observation was met with modest silence true enough was said everybody's not a kulikov or an a you've got to show what you're made of before you've a right to speak i say pals after all why do we remain in the place struck in a prisoner seated by the kitchen window he spoke drawlingly but the man you could see enjoyed it all he slowly rubbed his cheek with the palm of his hand why do we stop it's no life at all we've been buried though we're alive and kicking now isn't it so oh curse it you can't get out of prison as easy as shaking off an old boot i tell you it sticks to your calves what's the good of pulling a long face over it but look here there is kulikov now began one of the most eager a mere lad kulikov exclaimed another looking askance at the young fellow kulikov they don't turn out kulikovs by the dozen and a eh, pals there's a lad for you ay ay 
he'll get kulikov just where he wants him as often as he wants him he's up to everything he is i wonder how far they've got that's what i want to know said one then the talk went off into details had they got far from the town what direction did they go off in which gave them the best chance then they discussed distances and as there were convicts who knew the neighbourhood well these were attentively listened to next they talked over the inhabitants of the neighbouring villages of whom they seemed to think as badly as possible there was nobody in the neighbourhood the convicts believed who would hesitate at all as to the course to be pursued nothing would induce them to help the runaways quite the other way these people would hunt them down if you only knew what bad fellows these peasants are rascally brutes peasants indeed worthless scamps these siberians are as bad as bad can be they think nothing of killing a man oh well our fellows yes that's it they may come off second best our fellows are as plucky as plucky can be well if we live long enough we shall hear something about them soon well now what do you think do you think they will really get clean away i am sure as i live that they'll never be caught said one of the most excited giving the table a great blow with his fist hm that's as things turn out i'll tell you what friends says skuratov if i once got out i'd stake my life they'd never get me again you everybody burst out laughing they would hardly condescend to listen to him but skuratov was not to be put down i tell you i'd stake my life on it with great energy why i made my mind up to that long ago i'd find means of going through a keyhole rather than let them lay hands on me oh don't you fear when your belly got empty you'd just go creeping to a peasant and ask him for a morsel of something fresh laughter i ask him for victuals you're a liar hold your jaw can't you we know what you were sent here for you and your uncle vasha killed some peasant for bewitching your cattle more laughter the more serious among them seemed very angry and indignant you're a liar cried skuratov it's mikita who told you that i wasn't in that at all it was uncle vasha don't you mix my name up in it i'm a moscow man and i've been on the tramp ever since i was a very small thing look here when the priest taught me to read the liturgy he used to pinch my ears and say repeat this after me have mercy on me lord out of thy great goodness and he used to make me say with him they've taken me up and brought me to the police station out of thy great goodness and the like i tell you that went on when i was quite a little fellow all laughed heartily again that was what skuratov wanted he liked playing clown soon the talk became serious again especially among the older men and those who knew a good deal about escapes those among the younger convicts who could keep themselves quiet enough to listen seemed highly delighted a great crowd was assembled in and about the kitchen there were none of the warders about so everybody could give vent to his feelings in talk or otherwise one man i noticed who was particularly enjoying himself a tartar a little fellow with high cheekbones and a remarkably droll face his name was mametka he could scarcely speak russian at all but it was odd to see the way he craned his neck forward into the crowd and the childish delight he showed well mametka my lad yakchi yakchi ook yakchi said mametka as well as he could shaking his grotesque head yakchi they'll never catch them eh yak 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 and mametka waggled his head and threw his arms about you're a liar then and i don't know what you're talking about hey that's it that's it yakchi answered poor mametka all right good yakchi it is skuratov gave him a thump on the head which sent his cap down over his eyes and went out in high glee and mametka was quite chapfallen for a week or so a very tight hand was kept on everybody in the jail and the whole neighbourhood was repeatedly and carefully searched how they managed it i cannot tell but the prisoners always seemed to know all about the measures taken by the authorities for recovering the runaways for some days according to all we heard things went very favourably for them no traces whatever of them could be found our convicts made very light of all the authorities were about and were quite at their ease about their friends and kept saying that nothing would ever be found out about them all the peasants round about were roused we were told and watching all the likely places woods ravines etc stuff and nonsense said our fellows who had a grin on their faces most of the time they're hidden at somebody's place who's a friend that's certain they're not the fellows to chance things they've made all sure 
the general idea was in fact that they were still concealed in the suburbs of the town in a cellar waiting till the hue and cry was over and for their hair to grow that they would remain there perhaps six months at least and then quietly go off all the prisoners were in the most fanciful and romantic state of mind about the things suddenly eight days after the escape a rumour spread that the authorities were on their track this rumour was at first treated with contempt but towards evening there seemed to be more in it the convicts became much excited next morning it was said in the town that the runaways had been caught and were being brought back after dinner there were further details the story was that they had been seized at a hamlet seventy versts away from the town at last we had fully confirmed tidings the sergeant major positively asserted immediately after an interview with the major that they would be brought into the guard-house that very night they were taken there could be no doubt of it it is difficult to convey an adequate idea of the way the convicts were affected by the news at first their rage was great then they were deeply dejected then they began to be bitter and sarcastic pouring all their scorn not on the authorities but on the runaways who had been such fools as to get caught a few began this then nearly all joined except a small number of the more serious thoughtful ones who held their tongues and seemed to regard the thoughtless fellows with great contempt poor kulikov and a were now just as heartily abused as they had been glorified before the men seemed to take a delight in running them down as though in being caught they had done something wantonly offensive to their mates it was said with high contempt that the fellows had probably got hungry and couldn't stand it and had gone into a village to ask bread of the peasants which according to tramp etiquette it appears is to come down very low in the world indeed in this supposition the men turned out to be quite mistaken for what had happened was that the tracks of the runaways out of the town were discovered and followed up they were ascertained to have got into a wood which was surrounded so that the fugitives had no recourse but to give themselves up they were brought in that night tied hands and foot under armed escort all the convicts ran hastily to the palisades to see what would be done with them but they saw nothing except the carriages of the governor and the major which were waiting in front of the guard-house the fugitives were ironed and locked up separately their punishment being adjourned till the next day the prisoners began all to sympathize with the unhappy fellows when they heard how they had been taken and learned that they could not help themselves and the anxiety about the issue was keen they'll get a thousand at least a thousand is it i tell you they'll have it till the life is beaten out of them a may get off with a thousand but the other they'll kill why he's in the special section they were wrong a was sentenced to five hundred strokes his previous good conduct told in his favour and this was his first prison offence kulikov i believe had fifteen hundred the punishment upon the whole was mild rather than severe the two men showed good sense and feeling for they gave nobody's name as having helped them and positively declared that they had made straight for the woods without going into anybody's house i was very sorry for kulikov to say nothing of the heavy beating he got he had thrown away all his chances of having his lot as a prisoner lightened later he was sent to another convict establishment a did not get all he was sentenced to the physicians interfered and he was let off but as soon as he was safe in the hospital he began blowing his trumpet again and said he would stick at nothing now and that they should soon see what he would do kulikov was not changed a bit as decorous as ever and gave himself just the same airs as ever manner or words to show that he had had such an adventure but the convicts looked on him quite differently he seemed to have come down a good deal in their estimation and now to be on their own level every way instead of being a superior creature so it was that poor kulikov's star paled success is everything in this world End of chapter 9. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 2. Chapter 10 of The House of the Dead by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translator Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 10. Freedom. 
this incident occurred during my last year of imprisonment my recollection of what occurred this last year is as keen as of the events of the first years but i have gone into detail enough in spite of my impatience to be out this year was the least trying of all the years i spent there i had now many friends and acquaintances among the convicts who had by this time made up their minds very much in my favour many of them indeed had come to feel a sincere and genuine affection for me the soldier who was assigned to accompany my friend and myself simultaneously discharged out of the prison very nearly cried when the time for leaving came and when we were at last in full freedom staying in the rooms of the government building placed at our disposal for the month we still spent in the town this man came nearly every day to see us but there were some men whom i could never soften or win any regard from god knows why and who showed just the same hard aversion for me at the last as at the first something we could not get over stood between us i had more indulgences during the last year i found among the military functionaries of our town old acquaintances and even some old schoolfellows and the renewal of these relations helped me thanks to them i got permission to have some money to write to my family and even to have some books for some years i had not had a single volume and words would fail to tell the strange deep emotion and excitement which the first book i read at the jail caused me i began to devour it at night when the doors were closed and read it till the break of day it was a number of a review and it seemed to me like a messenger from the other world as i read my life before the prison days seemed to rise up before me in sharp definition as of some existence independent of my own which another soul had had then i tried to get some clear idea of my relation to current events and things whether my arrears of knowledge and experience were too great to make up whether the men and women out of doors had lived and gone through many things and great during the time i was away from them and great was my desire to thoroughly understand what was now going on now that i could know something about it all at last all the words i read were as palpable things which i wanted rather to feel sensibly than get mere meaning out of i tried to see more in the text than could be there i imagined some mysterious meanings that must be in them and tried at every page to see allusions to the past with which my mind was familiar whether they were there or not at every turn of the leaf i sought for traces of what had deeply moved people before the days of my bondage and deep was my dejection when it was forced on my mind that a new state of things had arisen a new life among my kind which was alien to my knowledge and my sentiments i felt as if i was a straggler left behind and lost in the onward march of mankind yes there were indeed arrears if the word is not too weak for the truth is that another generation had come up and i knew it not and it knew not me at the foot of one article i saw the name of one who had been dear to me with what avidity i flung myself on that paper but the other names were nearly all new to me new workers had come upon the scene and i was eager to know their doings and themselves it made me feel nearly desperate to have so few books and to know how hard it would be to get more at an earlier date in the old major's time it was a dangerous thing indeed to bring books into the jail if one was found when the whole place was searched as was regularly done great was the disturbance and no efforts were spared to find out how they got in and who had helped in the offence i did not want to be subjected to insulting scrutiny and if i had it would have been useless i had to live without books and did shut up in myself tormenting myself with many a question and problem on which i had no means of throwing any light but i can never tell it all it was in winter that i came in so in winter i was to leave on the anniversary day oh with what impatience did i look forward to the thrice blessed winter how gladly did i see the summer die out the leaves turn yellow on the trees the grass turn dry over the wide steppe summer is gone at last the winds of autumn howl and groan the first snow falls in whirling flakes the winter so long long prayed for is come come at last oh how the heart beats with the thought that freedom was really at last at last close at hand yet it was strange as the time of times the day of days grew nearer and nearer so did my soul grow quieter and quieter 
i was annoyed at myself reproached myself even with being cold indifferent many of the convicts as i met them in the courtyard when the day's work was done used to get out and talk with me to wish me joy ah little father alexander petrovitch you'll soon be out now and here you'll leave us poor devils behind well mertinoff have you long to wait still i asked the man who spoke ay oh good lord i've seven years of it yet to weary through then the man sighed with a far-away wandering look as if he was gazing into those intolerable days to come yes many of my companions congratulated me in a way that showed they really felt what they said i saw too that there was more disposition to meet me as man to man they drew nearer to me as i was to leave them the halo of freedom began to surround me and caring for that they cared more for me it was in this spirit they bade me farewell k a young polish noble a sweet and amiable person was very fond about this time of walking in the courtyard with me the stifling nights in the barracks did him much harm so he tried his best to keep his health by getting all the exercise and fresh air he could i am looking forward impatiently to the day when you will be set free he said with a smile one day for when you go i shall realize that i have just one year more of it to undergo need i say what i can yet not help saying that freedom in idea always seemed to us who were there something more free than it ever can be in reality that was because our fancy was always dwelling upon it prisoners always exaggerate when they think of freedom and look on a free man we did certainly the poorest servant of one of the officers there seemed a sort of king to us everything we could imagine in a free man compared with ourselves at least he had no irons on his limbs his head was not shaven he could go where and when he liked with no soldiers to watch and escort him the day before i was set free as night fell i went for the last time all through and all round the prison how many a thousand times had i made the circuit of those palisades during those ten years there at the rear of the barracks had i gone to and fro during the whole of that first year a solitary despairing man i remember how i used to reckon up the days i had still to pass there thousands thousands god how long ago it seemed there's the corner where the poor prisoned eagle wasted away petrov used often to come to me at that place it seemed as if the man would never leave my side now he would place himself by my side and walk along without ever saying a word as though he knew all my thoughts as well as myself and there was always a strange inexplicable sort of wondering look on the man's face how many a mental farewell did i take of the black squared beams in our barracks ah me how much joyless youth how much strength for which use there was none was buried lost in those walls youth and strength of which the world might surely have made some use for i must speak my thoughts as to this the hapless fellows there were perhaps the strongest and in one way or another the most gifted of our people there was all that strength of body and of mind lost hopelessly lost whose fault is that yes whose fault is that the next day at an early hour before the men were mustered for work i went through all the barracks to bid the men a last farewell many a vigorous horny hand was held out to me with right good will some grasped and shook my hand as though all their hearts went with the act but these were the more generous souls most of the poor fellows seemed so much to feel that for them i was already a man changed by what was coming that they could feel scarce anything else they knew that i had friends in the town that i was going away at once to gentlemen that i should sit at their table as their equal this the poor fellows felt and although they did their best as they took my hand that hand could not be the hand of an equal no i too was a gentleman now some turned their backs on me and made no reply to my parting words i think too that i saw looks of aversion on some faces the drum beat all the convicts went to their work and i was left to myself suchiloff had got up before everybody that morning and now set himself tremblingly to the task of getting ready for me a last cup of tea poor suchiloff how he cried when i gave him my clothes my shirts my trouser straps and some money taint that taint that he said and he bit his trembling lips it's that i'm going to lose you alexander petrovitch what shall i do without you there was akim akimitch too him also i bade farewell 
your turn to go will come soon i pray said i ah no i shall remain here long long very long yet he just managed to say as he pressed my hand i threw myself on his neck we kissed ten minutes after the convicts had gone out my companion and myself left the jail for ever we went to the blacksmith's shop where our irons were struck off we had no armed escort we were there attended by a single sub-officer it was convicts who struck off our irons in the engineer's workshop i let them do it for my friend first then went to the anvil myself the smiths made me turn round seized my leg and stretched it on the anvil then they went about the business methodically as though they wanted to make a very neat job of it indeed the rivet man turn the rivet first i heard the master smith say there so so now a stroke of the hammer the irons fell i lifted them up some strange impulse made me long to have them in my hands for one last time i couldn't realize that only a moment before they had been on my limbs good-bye 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 said the convicts in their broken voices but they seemed pleased as they said it yes farewell liberty new life resurrection from the dead unspeakable moment end of chapter ten recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the house of the dead by fyodor dostoevsky translator unknown